Bush oh my deed and welcome to this Thursday stream of Das Plumas de Seymour. How are you? Tuturi te chabar. I am very pleased to be here today with you. And uh, salam, Nazar Rose. Are you good? Hello, Nana. How are you? I hope you've all had a beautiful week. And my week has not been bad so far. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Um, And I am very excited about today because we are talking about mythology and literature because this is one of the best topics ever. And actually, this stream is going to be quite special. If you came to the last one, you know already. But from for this stream, we actually are going to be reading for my for my thesis, like from my PhD, from my chunky baby girl. We have it here because I mean, it was just about damn time that I started kind of like dropping and hinting parts of the thesis in the streams because it took me a lot of work and a lot of effort and I want to share this with you. Um, hello, Veronica. Oh, hello, Matisam. Are you okay? Um, so I cannot go by without saying thank you to my patrons because they are always supporting me and they are a fantastic bunch and I just love them a lot. Thanks to all the community that is suddenly growing steadily and, and, and you know, it's beautiful. I'm not the biggest one with the biggest numbers and stuff but the one that i have they stay and that is wonderful and gorgeous and um today actually i was uh before getting into the meat and potatoes of the stream today today i actually was feeling a little bit we can say nostalgic because i've been uploading on ibox and spotify podcasts my readings of the show on on the request of many um and of course in order to do so, I need to gather the audio from former videos and past videos and some of them, some of them are for a very long while ago and that's always super beautiful and nostalgic for me to see because there's people that used to hang out loads when I had more time and I could just do more Twitch and these people still stay in my Patreon, in my Discord, but they don't come to the that often and also I can see an improvement and differences between how I used to do live streams two years ago and how I do it them now and I think I think it's nice I think it's cute and it's a very heartwarming feeling and uh, for that I'm very grateful although although I won't deny this a glimpse of sadness a little I wouldn't say sadness per se it's much more like a melancholic feeling about the idea of these people not being around anymore or things just haven't changed because I love to spend time with you here on Twitch Butcher but life changes, circumstances changes and as long as I have a bit of time I'm gonna continue here so yeah that that was cute uh, in some of the streams I was talking a little about like Twitter and Twitter drama and you know, let me tell you so happy that I'm not using that platform anymore nothing wrong with it and if you if that's the kind of ball you want to attend be my guest but definitely definitely it was it was not my cup of tea anymore and i did not enjoy that much twitter uh when i left i never delete the account for those of you who ask me i never deleted the account but i just don't use it and um and that would be it hello tierra hello eric how are you guys today today we are going to be talking about one of the heroes that I like the most about Persian mythology, and that's no other than Gershosp himself. The reason I wanted to bring him was because, well, first, first and foremost, he appears in my thesis. Why? Because Simur features in the Gershosp's nome, and um, I think, I mean, for me, that's the Sigmund argument, that's more than enough, but also because Upon self-reflection, I realize that I tend to say a lot of negative things about heroic figures. I am not fond of classical heroes such as Gilgamesh or Rostam. De definitely, definitely not my best buds to hang out with. But it looks I make it look like I hate all the heroes, and that's not the case at all. You know, I love what they do with all my heart and soul. In fact, one of the episodes I was uploading had to do with the passing of our Dragon King and that was so sad. But yeah, I remember that I cried on the live stream and I'm not ashamed of that. Oh, about crying, I want to mention, uh, touch upon something, uh, hopefully I won't forget. Just like pin on that thought to us. So, uh, how are you? Um, hello, Nefertun. And um, I, I was actually crying live 
in this stream when Fairy Doom passed because he's such an important character, not just for the Book of Kings, but personally for me. And I am I, I grew fond of Fairy Doom over repetition and over readings and readings. I think I got to understand him and his circumstances quite well and I kind of absorbed that I absorbed them and the cycle, the narrative cycle of Fairy Doom is one of my favorites. So there you have it. And also I am um, I was revisiting all the episodes like that when I read you about Zol and Rudabe, which was fantastic and I had a blast. And the first time we met Manusher, oh, the moment of the death of Iraj. The roller coaster of emotions. I wanted to grab the Book of Kings, but it's actually not at hand. It's like, like it's just opposite my, my green screen. But but yeah, I mean, I, I could. <laughs> it's always in my heart, always present. Team Cow for the win. Yes, of course, always Team Cow. And something I wanted to point out in the most, please, please do understand, I'm saying this word in the most respectful way possible. A person contacted me over social media and I think given the way they had to speak in Spanish that it was not their main language at all. And I know they were Iranian because they stated so. And this person apparently really likes my reading of the Book of Kings, but he asked me, everything was very polite. I need to I need to emphasize this. Everything was very polite, but this person was asking me not to laugh when I was reading the Book of Kings because the Book of Kings contained important scenes that are heartbreaking, such as the death of Iraj and many others that I'm not going to list because that will be a spoiler. And I wanted to reflect upon that because I don't know why this person thought Maybe because it's not the same culture or vehicle. And I, I think it must have something to do with that. But this person took my laughter as a way of mocking the Book of Kings. That's the reason I believe Spanish or English are not the languages of, ex of expertise. Because you know I've never referred to the Shaname in any disrespectful way. However, I mess a lot with the characters because I'm reading it, of course, from a modern perspective and I'm very much aware. This is not an academic channel. I leave my academic self for stuff like this, for my thesis, my publications, my talks, my book chapters, you know, the standard academic usual content. However, I don't think laughing at something that's ridiculous means any disrespect to any source or book because we tend to believe that in the past people did not laugh, that people lacked a sense of humor and humor is something we invented like in the modern times. We could not be more mistaken because I'm really sorry if this offends anyone, but a person making himself be lifted to the sky by four eagles in order to touch the heavens, uh -huh, that is ridiculous and that's funny. Even the characters in the show on Omer don't take Kai Kavu seriously. So Give laughs a lot about his own king. Rostam insults his own king and laughs at him. So why am I not allowed to do so? Or why would that come out as disrespectful? That is something I do not believe. I don't think the Book of Kings is something sacred that one should not dare touch upon. Absolutely not. The Book of Kings was written to be heard, to be listened, to be enjoyed, to be absorbed. And some things are heartbreaking and hurtful and tearful. And those for those scenes, I cry and I have the worst time of my life. But all the scenes are heartwarming and they have this cozy feeling and they're beautiful and they're epic. And some of them are bloody and some of them are distasteful and some of them are funny. And those I'm going to be carried out for these emotions because I think it is my responsibility to transmit the, the message is pure and alive. Pure in the sense is genuine, not pure as in like the purification. No, 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 genuine. And that's just the way I have to do things. I'm not saying at all that this is the way. This is the way. No, <laughs> not Mandalorians for this one. This is just my way of doing things. Of course, if this is something you're not comfortable with because you feel like I am insulting, in any manner, in any facet, at any capacity, your cultural heritage. First, I think you should revisit the thought because I would not dare to. And second, you're always more than welcome to not accompany me through the journey of reading the Book of Kings. Because if this makes you uncomfortable, absolutely, I understand. That is not something I have a problem with. 
Not at all. But regarding my readings of the Book of Kings, this is my Twitch channel, and in here we deliver a speech in a particular manner. So I'm going to be continuing laughing with the episodes of the Book of Kings, saying that Rostam is just a big bulk of an idiot, saying that Zal is the most beautiful person ever created, saying that Sibur is supreme and godlike, and she's like, she's at the top of the top, and the, at the top of the mountain she sits, actually. And... Uh, and yeah, and I just wanted to point that one out because, for example, Nefer is Iranian and I think she enjoys, <laughs> I take it that she enjoys my way of transmitting the Book of Kings towards you. Could be mistaken, but that's the general feeling I have. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, books, first of all, books, any kind of content or art do not belong, they don't belong to just one community. They belong to us all because fortunately, in this case, for better, we live in a global world and we can share the stories and we can share the cultural heritage from multiple parts of the world between each other. And I think that's wonderful. And um, second, when you make things untouchable, you make them not reachable. And therefore, there's this aura of prohibition and secrecy that there's not any good to a book that was a political project, <laughs> basically, because the Shah Nome was nothing. It was not innocent. It was everything but innocent. So, oh, hello, Nefer. The way you narrate the Shah Nome, I'm so fond of. The only way I would consume it, you do it with so much love and respect and research and joy and sadness and all the emotions it takes us upon. Nobody owns the book, our history in that matter. The journey is different for each and everyone reading it. Preach! Preach nefer june merci azizam. Thank you. <laughs> and again, I don't mean this in any disrespectful way. If you don't enjoy the way I have to deliver my speech, please don't stay. It's going to make you suffer. And I don't want you to make you suffer. I want to entertain you. But not like that. <laughs> not in the bad way. Anyway. <clears throat> que fallezco. <laughs> I don't know if I'm like catching a cold, tired from speaking at work. Something's going on. What? No idea. Anyway, now, now we can jump into the meat, potatoes and broccoli of today because we are talking about the Gorshos Nome, which is a Persian epic containing the deeds and adventures of, you guessed it, Gershosp. I wanted to remind you that uh, the word Nome because we have we have a lot of names actually. We have the Shah Name, we have the Sam Name. Because yes, Sam, you know, Zal's father, he got his own epope. <laughs> he got his own major piece of work, which is the Sam Name, which also features Siburg, and that I also read. I can talk about the Sam Name once. <laughs> to be fair, the Sam in that book is much better than the one in the Shah Name. <laughs> that was not difficult. <clears throat> Uh, we have the Shah Nome, the Som Nome, the Garishas Nome, the Rostam Nome, the Eskandar Nome. I think the one the Rostam Nome I invented is not, it's about the descendants of Rostam, but it's not called the Rostam Nome. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I made that one up. But I have an Eskandar, I, we have an Eskandar Nome, because in the past, Nome used to mean book. Currently, Nome means letter. Yeah, or for example, dissertation. This is Payanome. Payanome means dissertation. And the tobacco nome. <laughs> Chef's kiss. <laughs> and, um, and we have a lot of nomes because that means book. And um, I'm Iranian for anyone wondering. Yes, Yare Neferjun is Iranian 100%. And, and we have Mama. <laughs> We have Momon, we have uh, Nefer's mom to check in our broken Persian in case any doubt arises regarding the language. Mm. Which reminds me, Nefer Junazis, and we need to talk about the Hamazun and that thingy, that, because that's very, very interesting. Um, but back to Garshosp. So, I have some images of... No, no clue you did. And I wanted to say that other reason for me wanting to bring Garshas to the table is because two, because the main reason is Simur isn't there and he's in my dissertation. Two, because of 
the connections with the myth of God shows and the Western world and the Russian sources. And third, because of the dragons. Because everything's better with dragons. I don't know if Lulu June is like too close or what, but I, I, I wanted to pitch the volume a little bit up because I have the feeling that you hear me, but not that well. So I'm, I'm trying to not touch it that much. Lulu June, be ninja, come closer. Azizam, nefer June, how would you say come closer? Bia. Ah, uh, nas diktar. How is close? I used to know this. I am very ashamed of this right now. Bia nas diktar. Ah, I remembered it. I'm so proud of myself when this happens. So, um, we're going to talk. I don't have a script per se. Si, sí, bueno, muy bien. <laughs> this is an exchange because I'm teaching Nefer Spanish and she's teaching me Persian. Sort of. We're working on that. Muy bien. <laughs> no soy Ross. You can instruct Nefer as well. And um, so, about the God Shazam is that they have dragones they have dragons they have eshtoho and kuro you're here <laughs> salom azizam and <laughs> it just told me you're here oh that's beautiful and um everything's better with dragons so the way we're going to talk about it is that we're going to see an overview about the book itself and then we're going to talk about the author a little bit and then we are going to move into the argument it's going to be me telling you what happened because trust me this one is a funny one. I I had to read the Gorshas the Gorshas. <laughs> I had to read the Gorshas nome in Persian for my dissertation. That was difficult because it was very very difficult, and I um I used a lot of help from my passion teacher, but I managed to do so. Some of the paragraphs where Simur appears, and uh, I loved it. I really liked it, and now I can bring you proof that there is more than just one hero apart from Zol and Fereidun that I like. Because yes, I'm usually in the buddies side because I am team Zahok, you know that. But, but, I can also team up with the good guys when they deserve this. So first, what is the Gorshas Nome? What is it, this book? So at the time Ferdosi composed his magna opera, the Shonome, there were all the authors that started compiling poetic recordings of parallel previously orally written folk narratives. And the Garshas Nome is among them. He, um, uh, well, he, Garshas, the Garshas Nome, the book was um, the work of Asadi Tuzi, a poet, linguist, and copist from Tuz. If you remember Tuzi, if you've seen the live stream about Moroge, that may come, just come across as familiar. But we're not talking about the same person. And why is that? Because this nickname, Tuzi, is a nickname coined, uh, linked to geography, which means where you're from. In this case, Asadi was uh, the surname, and Tuzi, it was a way of saying where this person was from. In fact, now that I think of it, Ferdosi would be Tuzi as well, because he also was born uh, at the village of Tuzi. So, where is this? Is the province of Khorasan, west? East, sorry, East, Northeast, Iran, a little bit more closer to what would be modern day Afghanistan, around around there. And um, the poem was composed between 1063 and 1066. And it was dedicated to someone. The same that uh, Ferdasi Shah Name was dedicated to uh, Mahmoud Ghazni, which was Mahmoud of Ghazna, um, a sultan. This poet is dedicated to a vizier. So here you have it, no soy Ros. There's poems dedicated to viziers, such as you. And this one, the Garshas Nome, was dedicated to a vizier named Abu Dulav Shaibani. And um, in case you're curious, and in case you want to dive into the, the, the Persian version of it, there's a very good one. It was written and compiled in 1974. That's a complete edition in Persian by uh, Habib Yarmoui that I used myself. But also there's an online version at the website called Ganjur. And um, 
do you know Ganjur? Ganjur is basically a massive site with millions, gazillions and trillions of Persian poetry uploaded. The Shahnameh is there, the Gar Shahnameh is there, and uh, the um, Divani Hafez is there. Uh, the complete hour, hours, not the complete uh, works of uh, Omar Khayyam, Maulana, and all these people. So if you ever want to look for anything, anything uh, regarding Persian poetry, Ganjur is one of the best places to look at. So what happens with, how, how come how come these poems were created and why is it important and um uh, where hello loco how are you were there excellent copies of the sassanid book of kings in Ferdowsi's time that he would have access to possibly there would be copies of the khodainame but this is the thing there were at least four books of kings four shahnames before Ferdowsi took um took the the, the 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 wheel and basically compiled everything up to its end because yes the Khodainame was definitely used as as a source for the book of kings this one however the Gershat Zame did not use the Khodainame instead this book focused much more in the descendant which is Garshas which is one of the sorry not descendant ancestor I was like conf uh, confounding the words so um this one focuses out much more in mythology and folklore rather than politics themselves because if you know something about the shahnameh and this is some this is an idea that i repeat over and over is that the shahnameh is not an innocent product and it's just not the result of creativity or freedom of of, of creation absolutely not the shahnameh is a political product and it has a very clear goal and aim and a message to pass on to the next generations the gershav's kind of the gershav's is a poem it's um is a result of its time and therefore the heroic figures embody the values that were desirable in kings and princes and of course the people represented here are models and archetypes of something that was desired for the rest of the world however is not that political is much more free in that sense if we can call it that is a little bit takes a little bit more liberty and rejoices a bit more in the poetry in the mythology of the moment in the epic and because basically basically what Garshasp is is a dragon slayer because this poet this poem sorry follows Garshasp a character that is only tangentially mentioned in the Shahnome because in Ferdos's work Garshasp is the ancestor of Nariman Sam Zol and Rostam. However, Asadi Tuzi's version presented him as the son of Jamshid himself, oh, and if following a much more ancient narrative that connects with pre-Islamic sources. And and because we preserve much more, because there's actually a bulk full manuscripts of the Gorshas Nome that have been preserved until today which is always amazing i mean we take that for granted though and that is not like, definitely not something we need to take for granted that is that is something to be grateful for um according to the author himself he used a source he used a book that uh, told the adventures of this hero of god Shosp, and there's a scholar there was a scholar named uh, francois de blois who believed this source could be a book called Kitabe Karshasp, the book of Karshasp, and this was this would have been written by Abu Muayyad al-Balkhi around 997, more or less, and this book is mentioned in another book, which is called Tarikh Sistan. Sistan is an area, it's a geographical area to the east of Iran. It's a very heavy mountainous area and it has its own legends and myths and this is from where the house of nariman heroes come from actually central asia is the place for rostam zol and nariman and um and this is something i i would like i would like <laughs> i can speak english uh i would love to talk about this in depth with you because tarikh Sistan is such an important book 
Because in the Shah Nameh, basically Ferdos, it mixes a lot of traditions. And the Tarikh Sistan contains already the stories of Rostam, Zol, Simurk is not present, although Zal is mentioned to be white-haired and albino. So um, it's, it's important that an author quotes a book that apparently he used. But we don't know if this is the case because uh, the Kitab e has not been preserved. And um, yeah, it's a pity. I was saying that there is um, Iranian and pre-Islamic Zoroastrian mythology involved in this. And yes, of course, there is. And uh, Gershasp is the Persian adaptation of the name of an Avestan hero called Keresaspa. Uh, Keresaspa, Kirsasp, Kershasp. Um, there's like multiple ways of pronouncing his name. I'm going to go with Keresaspa because a friend and a patron who knows about Avestan text much more than I do, he told me that the proper way, like the closest way of referring to him was Keresaspa. And I'm going to stick with that. Although I might slip one or two Gershasp in there because that's the way I'm used to call him, Gershasp. So in the Zoroastrian texts, Keresaspa is a dragon slayer. And um, yeah, this is what he does best. And he does it quite often, I have to say, because he does not just kill one dragon, but he repeats the deed usually, like often, because he's very good at it. And in the Avestan legends, these monsters, the, the Aji, uh, or the Eshdaha in Persian, they're present in, in many places. And Keresaspa is instructed to take them down. And the two of them that are super important, and I'm not going to dive into it because in case I speak about them some other time. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're very important. And um, what's also relevant is that the this hero, Keresaspa, he is a descendant of the clan Sama, which might have connections with them, him being the ancestor of Sam. It's a whole thing that comes together. And... Um, um, and Keresaspa was a very popular hero. In the Avesan text, we have his presence in the Yasna, in some sacred hymns, in the Menui Cherat. And why I'm saying this? Because Keresaspa was possibly very well known as a folktale hero. Possibly, and I'm saying possibly because I can't be quite sure, but the stories of Keresaspa would have been passed generation after generation because it's a very similar archetype to many others like to the very main core of what the hero's journey is there's a hero confronts a monster comes back blessed by the deity in charge at the moment and from what we gather from from the poem and also from the shawnome and from the best and sources written after this period like around the 9th or 10th century is that keresaspa was very well known and very popular. And that's the reason why Asadi Tuzi decided to just diverge a little bit, just, just separate himself from the narrative instructed in the Shonome and tell his own story about these Garshos and his deeds. And um, it complements the stories of Ferdowsi, of course, because the Shonome was his source. However, um, it is based in, in something in, in something else because it has, it has mentions that the Shahnameh does not have. And it's a whole thing how very well known and very well has been how to express this in a proper manner. It's, it's very surprising for me and very fun to learn about how well known it is that this book, the God Shahnameh, used another source for its composition. And when you compare the Book of Kings and the Book of Garshot, you can see those differences. And it's just, there's language, there's poetic forms, there's stories. It's, it's a lot of the, I am getting, I'm getting carried away. And no, I'm here to tell you about Garshot. So let's just, let's, let's just, just go into it. So this is not a poem as extensive as the Shonome. The Shonome has 60,000 verses, but the Garshot Nome has 9,000. This is not short, but it's not that long, definitely. And uh, this poem begins 
when the story of Jamshid and Zahak is taking place. And um, just gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and 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 read it about it. And I want to. Oh, there's so many things I want to show you. I don't have those many images, but I have. Um, oh, I can show you this one. This one's beautiful. But I have it. Let me just for a moment because the image is there we go because I want to show you like the general picture and then I can zoom it in they have it here sitting sitting we have to the left King Zahok we have King Zahok and before him in a cross-legged uh, way and with these beautiful red gown, we have Gershasp, the young Gershasp, sitting uh, before Zahag. How come? How how come? <laughs> See, another argument for me bringing this is that I love Zahag. You knew this already. And, um, well, Jamshid, as it happens in the Shonome, is overthrown by Zahag. And he flees to Kurang, who is the king of Zabolistan. And Jamshid falls in love with the king's daughter, a daughter that remains unnamed. <laughs> and um, then we have a continuation of lineages and kings having heirs, because Jamshid has a son who is Tur. Yes, that's from Turan. And then Tur has Shedasp. And then... <laughs> and then the Sham. And then Etret. And then finally we have Garshasp. Why caring? Why caring so much about this lineage? Because the poem needs to state very clearly that Garshasp is of royal lineage, royal blood. And because of that, he is blessed with the far. He has the divine protection and he's just chosen one. And fun fact, uh, Gershasp is born 700 years after <laughs> Tur and Zahog is still king of Iran. Remember that at this point we will be located in what in the Shahnameh is called the mythical era and here kings and heroes live an average of a thousand years, thousand, thousand five hundred, 2000, I think Jamshid, we made the count when we were reading this part of the Book of Kings and I think Jamshid went up to almost 3000 years, I think. But Zahog is also a very uh, longevous king. Like again, 1000 years is not that bad. And um, then, so <laughs> if I laugh, it's because I like it. <laughs> this is my way of showing emotion. And um, and then, well, um, Garshasp lives in Zabolistan and uh, he's just, you know, being educated there as a prince, as a hero, practicing with the sword, learning how to shoot from a horse, riding and feasting, you know, bazam, borazam. And, um, and then Zahog pays a visit to Zabolstan and then he, uh, he is quite caught. His eye is caught by this boy because he is so fascinating. He is so young, but he is so strong, so will-powered, so energetic, and therefore Zahak wants to prove him. And Zahak throws his challenge to young Garshas, and he dares Garshas to kill a dragon. And, of course, of course, Garshas does not only kill the dragon, but he delivers so swiftly. What image can I show you now? Oh, not this one. This one's a spoiler. We shall go about this one. Oh, there we have it. Uh, in the poem, he also kills like a million of them. <laughs> Not a million, but at least three of them, definitely. And so the child, the child, because I, I don't know how old is Garshas at this point, okay? But just for the sake of my own mental stability, I'm going to establish that he is in his teen years. I'm going to say 17, 18, 16, 19. I refuse to go anything below 16, 15. I, I can't. I just can't. <laughs> Cause, because sending kids to fight dragons is dangerous at any age. But please, please. Um, so he does in a perfect manner. And he delivers. Uh, he delivers so well. And this dragon is a dragon connected to the sea. The first dragon that slays 
that got just slayed comes from the sea and has just emerged there and is settled on Mount Shekovand. And um, this is this is how we know that Garshas is very very intelligent because in this world, in the Shah Nome, at least in the in the Iranian mythological plateau, dragons do not breathe fire. They are much more like serpents and they are very very dangerous and poisonous but Gershas knows of this already and he travels with a special antidote against the dragon poison and with special weapons that would help him slay the creature and beautifully he does so and Zahok is just so impressed and we're gonna go back to court we are gonna go back to court and to show you, I want to zoom in so you can see both of our protagonists. There is a div in there, I know, but we will, I don't think we're gonna, we'll mention it later. Yeah. Here we have them, both of them. Garshosp is, you know, sitting before him. And this is the tricky part, is that Zahok, who is a villain, takes Garshosp under his wing and he acts kind of as a tutor and as a protector of of uh, the youngster and um, the poem does not condemn Gorshaw at any minute for doing so because he just, just doesn't know better and he in fact is emphasized as a very loyal character because he is willing to serve Zahok until the very end truthfully he is not serving the most righteous of kings. But Jamshid was no saint either. Um, also, this is what is expected from him. So it is amazing you know so much. Not only that, that you are so academic, but also so entertaining. <laughs> and Willow Webb story writing and narrative and just the best never change. Ah, I see that! <laughs> Te como el corazón. Thank you so much. And if I was this you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> you always mean so much to me. I I am just beyond happy that you enjoy this because my rejoice, the happiness I take from just telling these stories and sharing them with you is incommensurable. Is that a word in English? I don't know. It's a word in Spanish, therefore I am making it uh, a word in English. Salud. Cheers. Nous <laughs> John? Cheers. Um, yeah, Nusa John. I, I, I say Nusa John to eat. Um, I don't know if it's the correct word. So thank you so much. We haven't just, we have just started. Like, this is just the very first thing that Garshas does. And definitely it's not going to be the last one. So as I was saying, Zahok is very, very, very impressed with the kid. And he sees so much potential in this young warrior. And in the meantime, as Garshas was killing <laughs> the dragon, um... There's been a revolt in India. The king of India has been overthrown by his relative, a character named Bahu. And this person, that would not be a problem per se, but happens that this person has renounced his loyalty to Zahok. And that, and that is something we cannot, we cannot permit. Uh -uh, we shall punish the rebels. Therefore, Zahok orders Gorshas to subdue the king. And uh, I actually have... I actually have Salam Minhampur Khubi. I have a picture of not this one. These all right, this is allow me to explain, okay? So this is a eighteenth, I think either yeah, eighteenth century manuscript, perhaps even nineteenth century manuscript of the Gorshas Nome. And here is represented a a battle in the ship, a naval battle. And this is very curious because, first of all, we don't have many manuscripts from the Persianate that represent boats. And here we have a bunch. And also because how they use scale. Let's, let's talk a little bit about art history, shall we? When we see figures like this, it's not that the Persians, the Indians, or whoever illustrated this were not aware of the size people used to have. Of course, they had <laughs> they had eyes. However, they're doing this to emphasize the importance of the main character, which in this case is Gorshasp. I don't know if you can see that, but Gorshasp is basically smashing the, um, the ox-headed mace. Is it an ox? No, no, it's not an ox, but it's uh, smashing his maze on the head of the rebel king, Bahu. And uh, I pretty much can't say that he's winning. So they had, th this leaf is actually not that big, so they had limited space. And for me, what's funny 
is that in order for you to understand that this was happening in the ocean, they filled every single space up with fish. Fish so big that they look like tiny whales. But anyhow, um, this is a representation of Garshas actually crushing the revolt in India. Again, like with the dragon, he performs outstandingly. He just does such a good job. And um, yeah, he just... He just defeats the evil Indian king and uh, then the previous Indian king is restored. Of course, this king is loyal to the hawk and we can continue. And um, then Garshasp goes to... I mean, he's in India already. He, he starts a tour, we can say. He just travels around the world. And uh, he goes to Zarandib, which is Zaylan. It is the Persian name of Zaylan. And there... It is very interesting because he sees the footprints of Buddha or in the Muslim sources, those are considered to be the footprints of Adam, the first man. And this is beautiful. This is beautiful, let me tell you. And then the poem, the poem starts retelling about like various legends about mankind and the first man, which was Adam. And then, and then, uh, Gashas meets, uh, Brahman. And then they start a very interesting debate about philosophical and religious questions. But, um, something, something to take into account is that the words that, uh, Asadi Tuzi puts in the Brahman's mouth, they, they're not that related to Indian beliefs. Um, quite the opposite. It's um, it's an opportunity that the poet allows himself to have and indulge in a synthesis about uh, Muslim neoplatonism because that was the academic and philosophical school that Asadi Tusi followed. The Brahman in India would have not ever talked about such topics, not because he didn't know, it's just because he would have not done so. So I, I know the fish look like they are going to follow Garshas orders and just take down the Indian ships. <laughs> In fact, if you see the, I think the, you see the archers Neferjun, they are aiming at the fish. So the fish, the fishes know. The fishes are, um, the fishes are dangerous. <laughs> The fish are dangerous. And uh, and yeah, and it's here in this part of the journey that Garshasp travels to many, many places in India. And among them is the island of Ramani. And this is the part from my thesis that I'm going to be reading to you because, because there are two sections where um, Simur appears. First of all, Simur lives in the remote island of Ramani and she is the most incredible and most unusual creature there. There are two sections where details about the bird are given. And the first one is a story told by Garshasp um, guide, the person who's accompanied Garshasp in this journey. And the second is a direct description because Garshasp has the opportunity to see Simor first hand. And I cannot emphasize how exciting that is because I can transport myself into Garshasp shoes and, it, and it's just mind-blowing thinking that he had the chance to see her like in front of him so um I'm gonna tell you first what the guide tells Garshasp about Simurg and um I want to put a, some other image in here what can I what can I say except you're welcome no, no, no. I'm gonna put this one here because this just um okay these are just poets um these are poets these we have let me check um oh yeah they the these person standing the only one that's not sitting that one's Ferdosi and since we are talking about you know the one in the blue coat that one to the left is Ferdosi and then we have uh Ash Jodi and um Wait, I have the... Let me check for my note. Ashjodi, Farrukhlin and Unzuri. They are just poets that are living in Ghazni and they're approached by Ferdowsi. This is not from the Garshas Nome, I think. Or is it? I didn't make a note about this one. Not good. I should have. Um, so, I'm going to leave Ferdowsi here because we're talking about Simurg and I don't have images of Simurg. Here, I have them all over my house. And um, so yeah, the first part that I'm going to talk about is what the guide 
tells uh, Gershasp. If there is one thing Seymour is famous for in this poet, in this poem, <laughs> is her strength. She is very, very powerful physically. The guy speaks about how the other creatures in the island, every single being that uh, stays in Romani Island respects her and fears her equally as she is the leader of all the birds. And she is said to be able to lift dragons and whales with her beak and take them up her nest because they are the they are her prey. They are her food. And also the guide mentions that if 30 people stood up on the back of Simur, she would not even notice. Therefore, she is incredibly, incredibly powerful physically. She's just, just a force of nature. And um, Simurg, although imposing and perhaps a little bit terrifying, is presented as a benevolent creature. She helps and feeds the lost travelers and she often fetches them water and food with her beak. This narrative is interesting because this does not sound like something Simur would do. And allow me to explain here, as a Simur expert. I have a PhD on her, I know what I'm talking about. So, Simurg, if you've been following the, the streams of the channel, you know this already, but Simurg does not like humankind that much. And this narrative of her being benevolent to travelers and lost people possibly takes from the description of Anka, a bird that belongs to Arabian mythology. Um, that is something very interesting that I also discussed in my thesis, how at some point different narrative threads intertwine and created this image that the complete image of Simurg about around the 13th century. And um, Simurg is also told to be the one that establishes peace among the birds and destroying dangerous creatures from the sea, whales, dragons, monsters of any kind, crocodiles. And regarding her nest, the poet Azadi Tuzi combines three different narratives to create his own. And this is something I really like because we've touched upon this before on the channel. Um, there is no such thing as purity. Purity is dangerous and leads to confusion. And what Asadi Tuzi does is that he reads a lot of sources and then he just cherry picks what he likes because he's telling a mythological story. He's doing no harm to anyone. And it's very useful to reset Simur because there you have like all three versions in one, like just compiled. So thank you for that, Asadi Tuzi. Because on the one hand, the nets of Simur is said to be upon a tree with a huge canopy of branches, so dense that it covers the stars. And then the nest is made of sandalwood and incense, like in the Chaonome. And this tree is at the peak of a black mountain, whose summit reaches the sky, like it happens in the Avestan sources in Zoroastrianism. And finally, the mountain and the tree are in a remote island in Romani, in the Indian Ocean. So, as you can see, pre-Islamic narrative, Zoroastrian sources, the Shahnameh, everything is here combined. This is what the guide is telling Gorshas as they are just walking through the island. And then Simurg appears. She interrupts the guide's narration by just appearing suddenly in the sky. She is described as filling the air with a thousand colors, like a flying garden with hundreds of different trees and a thousand rainbow flowers. And she has a scent of a garden as if the perfume came directly from the flowers and not from a bird. And she appears only for a moment before returning to the mountains. But the inclusion of a direct sighting with details enhances the poem's importance. And also this connects with a fourth narrative line, which is the Homer bird. The Homer bird is a figure from ancient Iranian sources, pre-Islamic, and I mean, we're talking about the Achaemenids here, that... Um, it was said, the legend told that this bird bestowed grace, happiness and the right to rule with its shadow upon those who had the chance to see to see it, even if it was only once in their life. This hummer bird is also transported to Sufism and literature further, but we're not going to delve into that because that's a little bit complicated. And um, very cinematic, the guide is doing some exposition and then Simur appears, exactly, because she is like, it's my moment to shine. And she just like 
flies over the sky. Ah, I love her. She's the best. And um, this encounter is very much more detailed than Ferdosi's because if you remember, Ferdosi barely says anything about her other than she's terrifying, don't go close her. She's very powerful, she shines. <laughs> At least the poem, The God Shouts Not Me, gives us some hints. She has many colors, she's large in size, and, um, and um, yeah, the, the, the Shona May is much more focused in action, as in what Simurg does, whereas the God Shona May is a little bit more, you know, like rejoicing in the beauty of the sight and the poetic form, so it's important to see what Simurg looks like and um, it's 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 very very uh interesting and it's just as eric was saying it's such a cinematic moment like a very epic moment in which god shows feels blessed with the sight he just experienced and he just like stays there for a minute completely flabbergasted blown out in his mind thinking wow did I just saw that? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. As you saw Simurg. But we're not going to stay just here. We're not going to stay in India alone because we are going to go further. And um, where was the other image that I wanted to? Oh, yeah, I have a lot of zooms in of, um, of this one. And uh, well, I told you that Garshas was kind of on tour through India. He was just traveling and visiting and living adventures. And at some point he just goes back to um, to Zahog. And um, of course, this poem contains a love story because because drama and because because yeah. Um, so basically here we have another people who is the people of uh, Rum. The people of Rum who are uh, the Byzantines at this point and yes, the, the, the Romans, <laughs> the Byzantines and um, in a very, very short time there will be the Seljuks from the Rum, but not yet because it's not the 11th century yet and I'm sorry, it's not the 12th century yet, it's the 11th century. So um, just, you know, these people, these people. <laughs> La gente. <laughs> and then um, Garishas just is attracted. He falls in love with the princess from the kingdom of Rome. And um, apparently they fall in love with each other. They marry. And they say apparently because I didn't get to read that part. And um, he just like... Okay, if there is something I have to say about God Shosp is that he is prolific. <laughs> like He does a lot of stuff and he does it in a very effective manner. <laughs> so he falls in love with the princess of Rome. He marries her. Then he, um, the king of Kabul uh, defeats his father, a threat in battle, but Gershaz kills the king of Zabul and restores his father uh, to the throne. And then he builds a town of Sistan, because <laughs> apparently it didn't exist, and, um, and invites, um, invites a hawk over for tea, I am guessing. And, uh, and then... And then he travels again. So you've seen how he does a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm summarizing it a lot because it's been an hour that it's me talking here. But he does a lot of stuff and he leaves a lot of adventures, falls in love, defeats kings and, and restores his father to the throne. And then, and then he goes traveling the world again. His adventures bring him to Kaira One in the north of Africa, where he defeats the king of Kaira One because he, he kills another dragon as in being there. And also he visits Cordoba. <laughs> as in Cordoba, Spain. And <laughs> what does he do in Cordoba? No, sorry. He, we don't know what he does in Cordoba, just he just goes there. And I, I didn't get to read this part, but I am just, just <laughs> As in, in Persian, I mean, because I learned that he visited Cordoba later, but I would have loved to, to read it. And um, yeah, he just he, he goes doing some tourism, some sightseeing. 
the side being a king to defeat, a princess to marry, a dragon to kill. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he returns home, his father, Atred, dies. And Zahok gives um, the kingdom of uh, Zabolistan to, to Garshasp. Sorry, not Zabol, not Zabolistan, Kabul. He, he, the kingdom of Kabul. I, I was, I was thinking about something else. If he was visiting Cordoba in July, it's normal that the dragon fire did not afraid him. <laughs> that is actually true. Oh my god, yeah, that is so true. But um, this is an episode of him slaying some divs because. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Okay, not because there's there's always a reasoning behind this. Um, these are the Zagzar. The Zagzar are a type of deep that use weapons that use the um, the branches of the trees as weapons, and uh, they're very dangerous and they're threatening the lives of the Iranians. So Garshasp goes takes care of the subject, and I just want to share some of the images from the manuscript. This is from um, the British Library, currently at the British Library, and the manuscript is dated 1573, in a very beautiful Safavid um, painting, and I love all the divs in here. They all are very funny to me, but. Particularly, I like, I like this one. I have like a million of, of screenshots of the divs from, um, from Safavid painting. But yeah, here we have it's literally split in two because they were, they enjoy, they were hardcore. Some, some of the Persian, the painting from the Persianate, it's, it's like, they were hardcore. Yeah, in fact, this page, let me show you. Let's go back to the to the general site. Um, wait for a moment. There we go. The oh, not this one. I I have so many images titles. Garsha slays something that I just was confused. So the page, the outer borders of this page are splashed in gold and the background, if you look at the horse rider, the, the horse archer on the top right, that is gold painting and it shines. Not this one, but I had the opportunity to work with Safavid manuscripts when I was in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. I was just there for an internship and, um, it is impressive how much the pages still shine because it's pure gold in the painting and it's just, it's just beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, mesmerizing and, and so captivating. And um, but well, we were we were with with Garshasp and his adventures, and um, he just named king of the, of Kabul after Etred dies, and then he adopts Nariman. Who is Nariman? The person who will become the father of Sam, who is the father of Zal, who is the father of Rostam. So this is the way that um, uh, Asadi Tuzi has of connecting the two lineages and the two bloodlines together, saying like, well, technically, um, Garshas was not the father, as in the blood father of, um, of Nariman. However, he adopted him as his own son, and that counts equally. In the Tariq Sistan, however, Garshasp is the grandfather of Nariman. And um, it's difficult. It's difficult because genealogy is not something that actually matters in this poem. Asadi Tuzi did not pay that much attention to that. It counts in the data's way, definitely. No, no, absolutely. That's that's so correct. The colors are amazing. The mixtures that they've used, they're very interesting. The internal chemistry of Nosiros. I know, I need to show you. Like, if we do, like, um, a proper live stream of... Um, uh, I'm just going to go to this one because I, I love the the red shot. I mean, I'm going to talk about this manuscript. If we do like a proper live stream on just a fabric painting, I'm going to do this research for you. 
a lay for you, my busier. I wanted to show you this one because it's one of my favorite manuscripts. This was made in Delhi, in India, around 1425, 2025, and it's called the Red, the red <laughs> It's called the Red Chaoname because the background. The background is very characteristic. It lacks any kind of scenery. It just goes to the point and has this powerful, not at all faded red color. And uh, it's incredible. It's, it's beautiful. And I want you to be aware that these beauties exist because this is what I'm here for. Shall we continue? We are very close to the end of the story of, of Gershasp. And, um, well, he becomes the king of Zawalistan because he has no sons. He adopts Nariman. And... Um, that's how the connection between Rostam and Gorshas, because the connection was interesting to be made in the sense that, you know, Rostam is a very big hero, he's super famous, and so is Keresaspa, so is Gorshasp. So we need to connect them both. Um, dragons and these colors, my eyes are doing chiribitas. <laughs> Sparkles. And, um... Oh, okay. And... Um, the very, very last things that um, that this person does, that Gershasp does, sorry, I am trying to find what my notes are. Okay, so Gershasp is on and about, he's doing his own thing, has a son now, and he's king, and then, and then, another famous hero comes in, who is Fereidun. Fereidun defeats Zahog and uh, becomes king of kings, and here, I one of the reasons I love this poem so much is because in this timeline, in this alternative universe, so to speak, Zahok never killed Barmaye. Barmaye is Feridun's cow, and she was his wet nurse, and she is such an important character, and her loss is so painful in the Book of Kings. Terrible. But in the Gorshas Nome, Barmaye is still alive. Yet again, another argument for me to bring you this one, isn't it? And uh, Barmaye is actually not only Feridun's wet nurse, she is also holy, the holy cow. She is also his right of preference. Because when they are marching to change a hog to Mount Damavan, Feridun in this procession, he parades on top of his wet nurse, on top of Barmoye, and is gorgeous, because this also is a link to pre-Islamic sources, because we have a lot of images of Feridun actually parading on top of Barmoye. The importance of Barmoye, I cannot emphasize that enough. It's, it's amazing, and I particularly love this one, because you can see young and powerful Feridun just riding Barmoye, you know, just surrounded by horses and his knights and he's beautiful. I, let me just reshape this one so you can see the complete page because it's gorgeous as well. Oh, it has such a beautiful forest in this one. And um, the landscape is beautiful. Look, look on how the prairie goes up in this swirling upwards movement towards the left of the page and how the tree continues this swell to create this movement and this sensation that the image, the, the, the landscape and the forest and the mountain are actually getting out of frame and going beyond as a sign that nature extends and it's much larger than what can be represented in this tiny bit. I love art history, I love manuscripts, I love the Persianate. This is my favorite thing to talk about. And of course we have Barmaye. I guess just could this day get any better? I doubt it, seriously. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. That flag is beautiful. And um oh, oh. I'm gonna zoom in again because I want you to see something. At Fereidun's back. Do you see it? Is the ox headed mace that he used to bring the hog down. And I love it. And um but but the story of Garshasp is finishing. We are getting to the end of this beautiful poem. 
And I said that uh, Zahog is king no more. And um, ooh, which one should we see? I think we can bring him to, you know, we can bring him to the very center of the stage. He's a protagonist. I'm trying to look for a picture that I like. Yeah, this one. He looks gorgeous in this one. And um, so Gorshasp realizes that he was serving to a king that was very evil, that was possessed by a naughty man. And then he he apologizes to Faridun and declares his allegiance to him as his loyal subject. And of course, Faridun, being the light creature, wonderful big-hearted lovey-dovey that he is forgives Garshasp and sure he allows him to work for him and he still does some he still leaves some adventures uh under serving Faridun he and his nephew go to Turan and then they fight some tribes in China and um they they go they, they capture some of the chiefs in there they bring them captive as um as for they do at this point nariman na, not not nari nariman not ahriman the devil nariman uh the son of the adoptive son of garshas has is his own son which is sam who is to be the grandfather of rastam and um in the end in the end garshas ends his life the same way he started. The adventure is that it goes full circle because he starts and finishes in the same fashion because Garshas goes to the north of Africa once more. He fights the king of Tanger. He kills another dragon. And then he returned home in Kabul and passes away. And here the poem finishes. And um, yeah. What I love the most, I love a lot of things about this point, but I really like the idea of completing the cycle. He starts his adventures by killing a dragon and he finishes his adventures. He finishes his adventures um, killing a dragon. Yay! And, um, oh, you need a deep name. You know what? There is a book. There is a book written from the perspective of the son of Divisapit, and that book is the Shabrang Name. I know Shabrang is a, a horse, is like a very famous horse. I'm not going to say who this horse belongs to because, because, spoiler alert, but yeah, and, um, and, um, and here we have the good Shabrang, but yes, Shabrang is, um, Shabrang is, it's not Shabrang, it's Shabrang. Shabrang is uh, a horse, but also the name of a div, uh, a black div. And I actually offered that topic to my patrons a, wh a while ago, but um, they preferred something else. But I shall bring it, you know, I shall bring it back because I love the Shabrang Name. And I mean, divs, manuscripts, painting. So I mean, thanks for doing this. Oh, no problem at all. This is what this project is about. Do you plan to do similar thing for similar books like Seven Labels of Esfandiar, Kushnama, and Bahman Name? So, um, let me explain a little bit how this works. Uh, this is a Twitch project, of course, but also this project has been on since like 2014 or something like that. And um, I started Twitch in 2020 and I also opened a Patreon page. So what I normally do is I offer some topics to my patrons who are my supporters and then they can choose what's coming next. They can suggest topics and kind of we, we do everything together in this community um, in Patreon. So patrons, you know who you are. Thank you for being there. So I could offer this to my patrons, but ultimately, I mean, even though the decision is mine, I listen to my supporters and I bring here what they like or what I think they would enjoy. I um, will read the Book of Kings, so maybe that is something you want to check. Um, all the live readings for the Book of Kings are up on YouTube, Twitch, and now on Spotify as well. And um, I could do these normies. I mean, I wrote, I completed, this is my thesis, my chunky baby girl. Uh, I completed a thesis on, um, on, on this, so I have a lot of normies to bring to table um join the best community ever ah this is the man as is the man 
خیلی ممنون متشکرم um, oh, if, if that's not a problem answering ما ما من خنپور um, Are you Iranian? Or at least from a Persian speaking country? Where can we get a copy? Unfortunately, <laughs> nowhere yet. I'm working on that, but I'm working also in a lot of things at the same time. So, cut me some slack. <laughs> I will do something. And also, I am, did I mention that I have a work night to five? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh, a kitty cat. A sleeping kitty cat. Thank you so much. Ooh, oh my God, for three months. Thank you so much. That is such a good commitment. Thank you, Rafiat. Oh, that is so lovely. Thank you so much. And um, I mean, yeah, and this is what I have for today, Bacha. Thank you for joining me into the adventures of Garshosp. And I think I've proven that I do like heroes. And I do like Garshosp, like a lot. He's so entertaining. He's very well-hearted. He's brave. He's loyal. He is so courageous. And... And he's, he is a reason. And look, I have a tiny horn. <laughs> a div. And um, and this he is the reason that Barbaya is alive. I mean, not him directly, okay. But thanks to him and thanks to these poems being written, Barmaya is still alive in some timeline. So <laughs> I listened to your episode on the Ask Historians podcast. <gasps> Did you? Oh my God, that's still around. And I had to check out your channel. Thank you so much. You can also join our Discord if you like. Let me invite you over to my Discord, as I always do, because I really like my Discord. And um, and I'm not, I mean, I know that I have Instagram and stuff, but I am not that active there. I don't know. Social media is not my thing. Um, I know, I know it's necessary, but it's not my favorite thing to do. This is my favorite thing to do. Thank you for today. Thanks to you for coming. And I hope that you enjoyed the ride. And most importantly, that you learned about a very famous hero because he's so important. Garshas has such a relevance within the Persian written narrative and the Persianate and the Zoroastrian and Mazdian heritage of Iranian culture. And in fact, I talked about Ajida Haga already, like you can find that on YouTube. Uh, thanks to you, Tierra. Cheers to you. Boom. Right, there's barely any tea left. I'm going to say the last sip. Oh, it's super cold. It's like, like super cold already. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, that I talked about uh, Ajita Haka, the video is up on, on YouTube and on Twitch. And uh, I plan to bring more Zoroastrian heroes and pre-Islamic stories to the channel. There's so many things that still want to talk about. So yeah, you're much more than invited uh, to stick around and live this passionate journey with me. Also, also, I am planning on getting the content ready. That's for you, Patron. Like, the, the, the schedule for May is almost ready. We have a tie. <laughs> like always, we, of course, we do have a tie between two topics on Patreon. So please, <laughs> someone break that. <laughs> Oh, I will and um, yeah that's uh, I think I, I, I lost I, uh, my train of thought which just vanished thank you so much for coming Bacha thank you for those who just arrived and thank you for those who are always here because I know who you are and thank you thank you so much this was such a fun live stream I love Garshas I love Garshas I love dragons I love Simurg and I, I just love everything <laughs> I'm very happy today I am very, very happy. And uh, yeah, I hope you had a good time. In the meantime, just check, you know, the Discord if you would like to. You can see all the previous episodes of the Shonome and all the stuff in the... Um, in, the, in the YouTube channel and in, on, on Twitch as well. Remember, you can now listen to the live readings of the Book of Kings. It's a little bit weird, I have to admit that. Because I, I mean, it's just the audio uncut, unhinged, unedited from the live streams uploaded to uh, to Spotify. And it's weird because the gist of it is being, you know, like watching me. <laughs> because I do a lot of things with my hands and stuff. But I think it's, it's a, at the end of the day, the story is what matters the most. So 
Bacha, thank you so much to you. And, you know, remember, Bacha, remember to create, to explore and to have loads of fun. Until we see each other next time, I bid you Khodafis.